Does your pet constantly scratch and lick? A skin condition could be the culprit. Many different things can cause dermatological problems for our four-legged friends. On this episode of The Paul Report, we're joined by Dr. Bailey Brain to discuss various conditions and options to help your pet live a healthier life. Stay with us. Paul Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paul Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Paul Report. I'm your host, Kelly Goodwin, and we've got an exciting episode of The Paul Report today. I'm gonna to pose a question to you. Uh, does your dog or cat itch a lot, scratch a lot, lick a lot, paws red? You know, you've noticed some things on, on maybe their body that just shouldn't be there. Well, this episode is for you because we are talking all about pet dermatology and allergies and everything you need to know about uh, symptoms, signs, and, and treatment. And to answer all of those questions, we have an expert from the University of Illinois, Dr. Bailey Brame, and she joins us today with a special friend, Java. She's new to the program, so we always uh, start our discussion with the Probably the most difficult question is tell us about you, yourself, and introduce us to Java. Sure, so um, I'm a veterinary dermatologist, and what that means is that I'm a veterinarian who has done some um, additional training specific to dermatology, meaning um, skin, allergies, and um, ear disease. And so um, right now I'm uh, working at the University of Illinois Veterinary Teaching Hospital. Um, and I brought Javi here with me today, um, and he actually is an allergy sufferer. So um, he has um, food allergies and some mild environmental allergies too. So I thought he would be a good uh, example for us today. Absolutely. Well, welcome to the both of you. I'm going to maybe just expand a little bit about, uh, upon your, your answer and ask what kind of led you to um, pursue the specialty of dermatology? Sure, well, um, for me, I've always really enjoyed um, getting to know um, pets and their owners and having a relationship over time and, and getting to see um, how the pet you know, improves with treatment. Mm -hmm. And dermatology, for better or for worse, <laughs> is one of those <laughs> specialties where we really get that follow through because most of the diseases that we treat are you know, long-term conditions. And so um, you know, we get to form a really strong bond um, with the pet, with their owner, and with their primary care veterinarian as well. Um, and so that's something that's always appealed to me. Now, Java, you said has allergies. Is that kind of how, uh, not necessarily you were paired with Java, but uh, maybe exacerbated your, your interest in dermatology? Well, we do have a, have a joke in the veterinary community that um, <laughs> a lot of these pets do tend to find us. Um, <laughs> I did not know that Java had any skin issues when, um, when he first came to me. Um, he actually belonged to my spouse before we married, oh, so okay. that's how he came into our household. I was inspired more actually by one of my, my cats, um, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, but she had both um, flea allergy and food allergy. Um, and so I was really interested in, you know, finding therapies to treat her. And, um, you know, that was one of the things that first got me interested in diseases that are kind of mediated by the immune system. And then that led into the interest in allergies specifically. How common are uh, issues, dermatology issues with both dogs and cats actually? They're really common. Um, they're actually the most common reason that a pet will be coming into its veterinarian for any sort of a problem. So, you know, with, with general practice vets, a lot of times they're seeing, you know, routine preventative care. But among the, the problem visits where a, an owner is coming in for a specific, 
issue, they make up about 80% of, of those visits for both dogs and cats. What are some of the, I guess, symptoms maybe that um, people should look out for? Um, you know, I think a food allergy, I don't, unless something you break out or you actually physically see something, you may not know. Yeah, and so with, um, with a lot of these, people are actually seeing some sort of, of change to their pet's skin. So um, a lot of times it'll be redness, um, you know, maybe some raised bumps, even some infections, so bacterial infections, um, which can cause, you know, pustules or, or red itchy bumps, thickening of the skin, you know, crests, scabs, those kinds of things can all also happen as a result of allergies. Um, we can also see a lot of ear problems and that may look like, you know, the patient's head shaking. Mm -hmm. um, they may have, um, you know, smelly, smelly ears or the owner might notice a lot of discharge coming from the ears. So all of those things can be signs of, of any type of allergy, whether it be food or environmental. Oh, and that leads me to is, what causes some of these allergies? Is it uh, more so environmental? Is it genetic? Is it um, airborne? Is it flea causing? I suppose you put everything in that pot and it can, it, it, it's a problem. Yeah, and you know, it would be uh, difficult to kind of talk through through all of the possibilities, but um, in terms of kind of the big ones, the most common type of allergy in both dogs and cats is actually um, flea allergy. And so um, that's always one of the first steps that we wanna make sure when we're treating a pet with allergies or any sort of itchy skin disease is that we are making sure that they're on you know, a high quality, regular flea preventative. And then um, from there, usually we're thinking about uh, the possibility of either food allergy or environmental allergy. And so with environmental allergy, we may see certain things that could clue us in. So um, for example, if a pet is um, repeatedly itchy at a certain time of year, so every spring, just like we might get our hay fever signs, mm -hmm. maybe the pet is then starting to lick the paws or um, you know scratch at the side, something like that. Um, if the symptoms are present year round, then we're kind of stuck t trying to decide between the possibilities of food or environmental. And grasses too, I would think. I mean, do they have like a, like an effect like we have with pollen or any, yeah. you know, airborne um, particles? Yeah, for sure. So, so just like in people, the most common things would be dust mites. So dust allergy is very common mm -hmm. if they're having year round symptoms. And then um, pollens would be the other, you know, big possibility. And so that can be grass pollens, you know, tree pollens, weed pollens, and sometimes the season can help us to pick that out. So tree pollens are more common in the spring, then we move into, um, you know, grass pollens in the summer, and then ragweed is really popping up in the fall. So sometimes that can help us narrow it down a little bit if there is some sort of seasonal pattern. So how do I know if my dog or cat needs to come to see you? Um, I notice them itching. It's maybe not something every day. Um, am I being too cautious? You know, what, what kind of is my trigger to know, mm, I better pick up the phone. Well, I think that um, in general, most people probably should be checking in with their primary care veterinarian first for these kinds of issues because since they do make up such a big, um, you know, proportion of, of the the kind of sick visits like we talked about mm -hmm. before, most primary care veterinarians are going to be comfortable managing, you know, mild signs, especially if they're kind of present seasonally. They just have to kind of get things under control. And so, um, you know, if you are noticing itchiness that's that's lasting for more than a few days, um, or if you're noticing, you know, changes to the skin, especially, you know, hair loss, um, redness, thickening of the skin, then definitely you would want to start with your primary care veterinarian first. Is it painful for them? I, you know, I know that there are different types of allergies and different responses and different you know, like you said, there it could be on the paws, it could be in the form of hot spots. Is all this very uncomfortable for the animal? That's a good question. And I think um, a lot of the time it's not overtly painful, but I like that you use the word uncomfortable because a lot of times it is. And I think the main thing that's causing the discomfort is the itchiness. I think we can all, you know, understand that you know mm -hmm. right now the mosquitoes are out we're all getting itchy but that itch is going away usually a couple hours after a bite right but these guys are itchy pretty much 
all day. And so um, they can be very, very uncomfortable from that, but it is you know, a matter of, of how severe that itch is and, and whether that's uncomfortable. Um, there are certain situations that can become painful. Um, the big ones for those would be um, ear infections in addition to being itchy can also become quite painful, um, especially when they're very severe or chronic. Um, and some paw disease can as well. Um, so some dogs will develop very severe inflammation of the paws. They may even have, um, you know, bumps arise between the toes. Um, and those, those can be so painful even that some pets will, will not really want to walk. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all kind of a, on a spectrum. You know, you, you've mentioned a couple of times the, the ears and I've had labs forever. And I, it may not be an allergy, but I'm going to throw it out here because it's, it's been a reoccurring problem with the labs that I've had where they get this brown kind of gunk in their ears and it does have an odor to it. Is mm -hmm. that more of an allergy or is that more of something else going on with them? So that's an interesting question because um, we used to think that with labs, a lot of their ear infections were coming both from the fact that they have, you know, floppy ears, so it's coming down, kind of trapping moisture in there. And then also they like to go swimming, so they may mm -hmm. have an opportunity That's to, you right. know, go out <laughs> into a lake, get some water in there, and then the, you know, the ear kind of traps it down. Um, now the way we're framing it is we think that that may potentially predispose labs to develop ear infections, but without something else, usually an allergy, that usually won't tip them over to the point that they get a true infection. So we think it's kind of a multifactorial process where there's both some allergy and then also some kind of breed related mm -hmm. and behavior related uh, causes as well. Well, since we're talking about breeds, um, is there any one breed over another or group of breeds that are susceptible more to allergies? Yeah, for sure. So there does seem to be some, you know, hereditary predisposition and it can be breed related. I would say um, the breeds that we see probably the, the worst allergies in are, are all of the um, bully breeds. So, um, you know, French Bulldogs and English Bulldogs, which are, you know, such <laughs> Very popular, popular pets, um, are definitely the most prone to um, skin problems and allergies. But we also see it with, you know, the Bostons, the, the Pitties, um, all of kind of the American Bulldogs. So everybody kind of in that group. But allergies don't necessarily discriminate. So uh -huh. we can see it really in, in any breed. What happens if they go untreated? Um, you know, somebody, for whatever reason, um, just lets it go. Sure, so that can depend a lot on severity. So, um, you know, for a mildly affected dog that's more seasonal, sometimes you can wait it out, right? If they're just a little bit itchy, you know, maybe a few weeks later that same pollen won't be there and then they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But with a lot of them that are more severe, um, we actually can see pretty bad outcomes um, if we're not addressing them. And, and that's because the, the degree of inflammation, um, especially once you get some infection on top of that, um, can lead to some pretty significant changes. And the worst would probably be ear disease and, and paw disease. Um, so with ear disease, we can see that the whole ear canal can potentially get um, actually closed down because the, the tissue in there proliferates and, and narrows the canal. And that can potentially require surgery to remove mm. the canal. Um, the paws, um, I mentioned that sometimes they'll develop little bumps between their toes. Mm -hmm. um, that can potentially become severe enough that there's remodeling as well. And so they may actually have to you know, surgically address that. It can affect how the pet is walking. Um, so it's, it's all definitely a spectrum and definitely depends on the, the severity of what we're seeing. It definitely should be treated though, bottom line. Yeah. Um, I go into your office and you do an exam and, and I'm hearing some terminology that maybe I don't understand. <laughs> Atopic dermatitis versus contact dermatitis. Um, what are they and what's the difference? So um, atopic dermatitis is um, kind of how we refer to a pattern of inflammation that we mostly see with allergies. So it's referring more to kind of the classic allergies like food allergy, 
um, environmental allergy to dust or pollens where they may be exposed, for example, maybe Java's out walking um, in the grass, he gets some pollen on his paws, but then where it shows up is he actually gets itchy years later and I have to do some ear cleansing, you know? So it may not show up right in the space where he is exposed to it. Whereas contact dermatitis, sometimes there's a component of allergy, sometimes there's not, sometimes it's just an irritant, um, but they're having the reaction exactly where whatever it is is applied. Um, and people can sometimes get those confused. So we have a lot of people who recognize maybe that the pet is worsening when they're outside, but they, they're worried more about you know, chemicals on the lawns as opposed to the pollen, which is oftentimes the more likely culprit. Are allergy, allergies curable? Um, or is this something that, like in Java's case, he's gonna have to you know, live with it and be treated for it for his entire life? In the majority of cases, no, it's not curable. And so um, part of our job is trying to come up with a plan that keeps their symptoms manageable, keeps them comfortable um, for the rest of their life, even mm -hmm. if they still you know, have this allergy. The one thing that can potentially lessen the severity of the underlying allergy would be immunotherapy or allergy shots. So that's similar to in people, where you would do an allergy test, to determine, okay, this particular patient may seem to be reacting to dust mites and you know ragweed pollen. I'll include that in an allergy vaccine, give it as an injection underneath the skin, and then over time, they may become you know less sensitized to those things. The majority of cases, they just kind of lessen the severity, but very rarely we can see pets that are completely cured. Um, my own cat actually has asthma, and um, mm -hmm. his asthma is completely controlled on his allergy shots, but um, he does still have um, some skin signs that haven't been fully controlled by them. They're much, much less severe than they were to start, though. You know, in comparison to humans, now I've never personally had the test done, but I've had friends who have had it and their children have had it, where they know something's not right, something's going on, they go in, they see a dermatologist and they do like a skin, um, they, they take a portion, you know, they a scrape, mm -hmm. and then it comes up like all the different things that they could potentially be allergic to. Is that similar to what you could do with a dog or a cat? Yeah, so it's, it is important to know that um, you can see false positives and false negatives with allergy testing. So what that means is that if you're a normal healthy dog or a normal healthy person and you do an allergy test, mm -hmm. it's possible that you may still see some positives. So we always like to start with having made the diagnosis clinically of the allergy before we do the test. Mm. But the actual test is very similar. Um, so with humans, you can do a, a prick test where um, it's very superficial, or you can do what's called an intradermal test where you're actually making an injection um, with a very small needle between layers of the skin. Um, and we do the latter for dogs and cats. Um, it tends to be a little bit more reliable than the prick test. Um, and so because we are having to make a number of different injections, they do have to be sedated, which is the biggest difference mm -hmm. um, between dogs and people is we can't ask them to just, you know, <laughs> stay chill there. out for a little bit, <laughs> like Java's doing right yes, now. Yes, Java's doing an excellent job of chilling out, but most, <laughs> most of our patients will not put up for that. Uh, but, you know, obviously Java is not experiencing any stress or anxiety right now, um, but can anxiety and stress cause skin conditions or... Uh, issues with my pet? Is that something that, you know, can be in, inflamed? Potentially. Um, it's one of those things where, again, we used to think that anxiety and stress were playing a bigger role in terms of being the primary cause of a pet's um, skin issues, and now we're realizing that allergies are much more likely mm. to blame as the, the primary issue, but we're also coming around to realize now that stress has an impact on allergies because it has an impact on the immune system. So it is all you know interconnected, and certainly we know that we can sometimes see flares in times of stress. And there are certain um, dermatologic diseases that are caused you know primarily just by stress, it's just that those are much less common than we initially thought. Mm -hmm. Can I take care of my pet at home? So, uh, it, you know, if it's shampoos or brushing or topicals or food, uh, is there a regime that I can follow? And I'm sure as you, as my doctor, will help <laughs> me go through this, but um, it, it, can it be a, a treatment that I can do behind closed doors and at my own home. 
Yeah, so topical treatments are, are a very important part of allergy management. So um, Java does get, as part of his, uh, his regimen, he does get medicated baths on a regular schedule. Um, and so for him, we use a medicated shampoo that contains chlorhexidine and myconazole because those are ingredients that help to fight bacteria and fungal overgrowth, which are a big issue for allergic dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. Cats usually don't tolerate the bathing so much, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, they don't like water. <laughs> but we can also use, you know, sprays and, and mousses as well. We try to rely as much as we can on topical therapies as opposed to oral therapies because it's always going to be better to give, you know, a topical antimicrobial as opposed to an oral antibiotic in terms of, um, you know, avoiding any stomach upset or anything like that. Now, you mentioned shampoos and, you know, with Java, he is, you're thinking he might have a little whippet in it, so his, his hair and his skin is a lot different than more of a woolly type dog that's mm -hmm. maybe like a St. Bernardish type <laughs> dog that's longer. And so is it, do you have to keep an eye out for what kind of uh, topicals you do use to make sure that it accommodates their coat? Yeah, so I would say the biggest thing is that with the dogs, especially like a Newfoundland or something that has like kind of almost like a waxy character to the, the fur, it can be a lot harder to get things to penetrate down to the skin because their fur is designed to repel water. That's part of you know, mm -hmm. how, they're, how they're bred. And so um, we may have to, to take that into consideration, maybe you know, having the owner actually you know, part the hair and spray right down. Um, at the, the level of the skin. Um, there's no breed that really shouldn't be shampooed, so that's kind of always an okay thing to include, but we may, the main difference I would say is actually how we treat um, the hair as part of the grooming process. So um, the, the methods that you use for brushing and, and how often you have to do that are the biggest things that differ between coat types. You know, we've talked a lot about care. Um, it can be, um, a rather expensive thing to treat allergies. I'm not looking for a dollar amount, but I think maybe one thing that you could stress to our viewers at home is that it, it is a commitment. It will be a financial commitment if your dog or cat ends up with an allergy. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, in addition to, um, you know, the, the financial commitment, we also just talked about topicals. I mean, there's a time component to it too. Right. Um, and so, we definitely want to come up with a management plan. I would say the, the biggest place where um, it becomes costly is in situations where we're, you're being reactive as opposed to proactive. So if you're waiting until your pet has you know bad skin infection or bad ear infection and only going to the vet then, then it's gonna be a lot more expensive because you're gonna be doing those visits on a repeating basis. And that's gonna happen for the course of your, your pet's whole life. Right. If you um, instead do um, kind of more of a proactive approach where you go back you know, for a recheck after the current infections have all cleared up and then you're kind of coming up with a plan to prevent future infections, that's ultimately going to save money even though in the short term it may hurt a little bit. <laughs> right, and that leads me kind of into my next question is as a pet owner, it's probably important and, and you probably welcome this as a doctor, that a pet keep a, a history at home. You know, on this date, I noticed that um, Jabba was doing this, he was itching this, he was really paying attention more to his ears, he was licking his paws. So that way when I come to you, and I, I'm not saying I'm waiting a year to do that, but when I come to you, I could say, this is what I've noticed in the last maybe month that mm -hmm. my dog is doing. Is that helpful for somebody to do? Yeah, it can be really helpful, and we do have some of our clients um, do that kind of voluntarily, and it's actually really helpful, <laughs> helpful. because um, a lot of times what we're doing is, you know, we have a pet come in, they may have any number of problems. Maybe they have, you know, a skin infection, ear infection, they're just really, really itchy. We're gonna try to treat those infections, but we're also probably gonna start in initiating some treatments to actually address the underlying allergy, whether that's putting them on a hypoallergenic diet, if we think it's possibly food, or giving them some sort of anti-itch, anti-inflammatory treatment if you know we're just trying to control that, that allergic inflammation. Um, then we're gonna start to kind of back things out and we need to know which of these treatments that we did is actually helping the most. And so if we can have kind of a record, not only of what's happened leading up to the appointment, but also what happens then, which of the treatments are helpful, which are not, that's really, really helpful to us. 
You know, in our last minute, uh, Dr. Brame, um, you mentioned when you went into this, you really enjoyed getting to know the pet, getting to know the pet's owner, and kind of following through with them. Any success stories that come to mind um, in your practice of dermatology over the years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say um, sometimes once they start to be successful, they stop wanting to come back. But <laughs> those are the patients that I most love to see is, you know, where they're coming in just for their annual visit. And it's because, um, you know, they're coming in just for a medication refill because they're doing so well, they haven't even needed to, you know, reach out during that that year. And it's nice to see them, you know, year after year and and know that they're they're really comfortable and happy at home. Excellent. Well, some very good information today for those uh, folks out there that are have pets that are uh, maybe suffering from derma, dermatology issues or maybe after hearing our discussion, they're going to pick up the phone and make that appointment to, uh, to get uh, their dog or cat checked out. So Dr. Brame from the University of Illinois, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Paw Report. Thank you so much for having me. And Java, he's just going to lay there and Soak it all in. <laughs> Thanks for joining us too. And of course, uh, we love it when our viewers of the Paul Report check in with us each and every week. So again, I'm your host, Kelly Goodwin. Until then, we'll see you next week. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Additional support for The Paw Report provided from Soggy Paws of Mattoon.